So apparently, according to Anna, it's time to start. So I'd like to welcome you all here uh, for what is going to be a tremendous conference day on COVID being decoded. As I look around and see the wonderful job done by the students from the six different uh, universities that put this together and the phenomenal students that are here, I have to point out to you that this little COVID here is going to be really scared by the end of the day. And that's why I brought him along so he would know he's in trouble. Uh, I have to thank, besides Anna, who put uh, the conference together uh, from St. Louis University and all the, uh, uh, the committee, I have a couple of other people we should thank. First of all, we need to thank the Health Resource uh, Services Administration, particularly Joan Weiss and Nina Tomosa, who put us in contact with the other universities and allowed us to put this together using money from uh, our, our GWEP grant. Uh, you should also point out that the idea for this came from a conference I took part with EU uh, students uh, about two months ago called Pandemia, where they did the same sort of thing. And they did a tremendous job and was one of the most exciting conferences I've gone to. So I will tell you that you're in for a absolute treat today. It's going to be wonderful. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And now, Anna, I hold up the hand over to you, I think, uh, to continue the... Yeah, so um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the COVID Decoded Conference. My name is Valentina Rabin, and I'm a doctor of audiology student from Louisiana State University's Health Science Center in New Orleans. Thank you all for, for attending, and we look forward to an exciting day of learning about the COVID-19 pandemic from an interdisciplinary perspective. We wanted to take a moment to explain who we are and why we created this conference. We're a group of 13 graduate students from seven different universities around the country. We felt that there was so much confusion and contradictory information about COVID-19 being shared. So we wanted to create a platform for students to directly learn from experts working in the field. Throughout the day, eight speakers will share experiences and knowledge from their specific fields of expertise. After each talk, there will be an opportunity for a live Q&A. At the end of the day, there will be another opportunity for a live Q&A with the entire speaker panel. To ask a question during the Q&A session, enter into the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. To view the schedule and order of topics, please see the schedule we have posted in the chat box. At the end of the day, we ask that you would fill out our post test, which will pop up once you close out of the webinar. This allows us to measure the impact of our conference, data we hope to publish. Originally, our hope was to reach a national audience, but we were excited to see an international interest. We have attendees from not only every region of the United States, but also from India, Mauritius, Peru, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Southeast Asia, Mexico, and Colombia. We hope you all benefit from this educational opportunity. Finally, I would like to introduce the rest of the Executive Planning Committee. Let's start with Anna. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Brendy and I am the chair of the executive planning committee. Um, welcome. I'm a um, social work student, second year from St. Louis University. Amber. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Darlington. I'm from the University of Utah. I'm in my third year for occupational therapy. David. Hello everyone, my name is David Huerta. I'm a Master of Business Administration student from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley and I'm in my second semester. Andrea. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Soto and I am a second year medical student at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Suchi. Oh Suchi, you're muted. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Sikita Javeri. I am a recent MPH graduate from the Emory Rollins School of Public Health and a second year medical student at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Nellie? Hello, everyone. I am Nellie Kislik. I'm from University of Buffalo, majoring in public health. Saba? Hi, everyone. My name is Saba Suleiman. I'm a a second year medical student at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Jessica. Oh, 
All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jessica Luhauser. I am actually a recent graduate of St. Louis University. I graduated from the program this August and I have my MSW. I was a master's of social work student. Justin. Hey, everyone. My name is Justin Wendell. Uh, I'm an alumni from UTRGV. I hold a master's of science in biology and I'm currently attending the master's of physician assistant studies program. Amna. Hi everyone, my name is Amna Pracha and I'm a final year pharmacy student at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in Princess Anne, Maryland. And Bo. Oh, Bo, you're muted. Oh, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bo Rainey, and I'm a second year medical student at A.T. Still University's Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I have the honor of introducing to you our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Dobbs. Dr. Dobbs is the Vice Dean of Clinical Affairs and a tenured professor and chair of neurology at UTRGV. He is also module co-director for Mind, Brain, and Behavior in the second year medical student curriculum. As chief medical officer at UT Health RGV, Dobbs shares oversight of the practice plan and the medical staff, and he is currently working on a long-term clinical strategy for UT Health RGV. He moved to UTRGV from the University of Kentucky, where he served as Associate Dean responsible for clinical and statewide initiatives, Associate Chief Medical Officer, and Interim Chair of Neurology. A stroke neurologist, he founded and built the 34 hospital UK Healthcare Norton Healthcare Stroke Network that continues to grow and bring life-saving treatments to underserved regions. He led a team that created a novel data management system, the Kentucky Appalachian Stroke Registry, which fuels clinical trials and original publications. He helped to create the subspecialty of clinical neurotoxicology, and his textbook, Clinical Neurotoxicology, Syndromes, Substances, Environments, is a leading reference text in the field. He also holds a patent for a dermatitis treatment that made it to the veterinarian market and provided relief to millions of small animals as Genesis Topical Spray. He has taught in the classroom on topics as wide ranging as financial management and art history, and he holds degrees from the University of Kentucky and Harvard. He's also served with distinction in the US Air Force. Please help me welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Dobbs. Thank you both for that, that introduction. Um, and thank you to the uh, planning committee for being invited to, uh, to participate in this, in this wonderful program. Um, I think it's the first time that I've participated as a speaker in a, in a virtual, fully virtual program. Um, I can say that I will not be surprised if uh, we do a lot more of these um, in science and in, and in healthcare even after the, uh, the COVID pandemic passes. Um, it's really a wonderful, wonderful platform to reach a lot of people without, um, you know, all the logistics that go around gathering in, uh, in a single city and, and uh, travel, et cetera. Really is a, a fantastic idea and I commend you for doing this. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that I can, um, deliver the slides that I have. And what I was asked to do was to uh, deliver, deliver an overview of COVID-19 and, and the impact of COVID-19. Um, most of what I'll talk about is really applicable anywhere in the world, although um, you'll see that I do that I do tend to probably center on some of the data around the United States and even, even around Texas or my region of, um, of um, the Rio Grande Valley, where I'm really, really happy to have moved to with my family about a year ago. Um, I think let's just get right to it. You all know that the World Health Organization declared uh, the COVID-19 outbreak a public health emergency of international concern earlier this year, January 30th and a pandemic on March 11th, 2020. Um, there's actually a lot of questions about whether, whether this should have happened earlier and whether it was sufficiently predictable that the WHO should have declared um, these emergencies at an earlier date and whether it would have 
prompted um, more health systems in countries to mobilize and deal with the pandemic better. But at this time, um, we have around 25 million global confirmed cases with deaths approaching a million. In the US, we're getting around 6 million confirmed cases with deaths of 182,000. And we really don't know um, right now where it's going to end. A lesson that always stuck with me is um, the disease host continuum. Uh, it wasn't mentioned in the introduction, it's not in my, in my bio, um, but I was a uh, microbiology student before I went into, went into medicine. Um, and so I've always, I think, had a special appreciation for um, virology and, and as I became a physician and a neurologist, really the interaction of how a, a disease agent, a pathogen, interacts with the human host and how some individual humans are more susceptible to an individual disease than others. And we're certainly, certainly seeing that with COVID-19. Although it's um, just really a, a higher likelihood that a healthy human might have a better chance of survival, it does seem to be rather substantial that being healthy really does help with COVID-19 and you know, with um, most infectious diseases, really, that you have that reserve to be able to um, survive all the stress that an infection, a serious infection, puts on the body. Um, over time, the most successful pathogens tend to fade in virulence. Um, one, one thing that I try to avoid is um, attributing human characteristics to uh, viruses or, or other pathogens because they don't really think or prefer. They just fit or they don't fit with the human host to which they um, to which they are exposed. So those that really fit with us um, tend to have mutations that lead to milder disease, which then results in infection and circulation rather than death of the of the human host, which you know, if they have not passed the disease forward, then the pathogen will uh, will fade fade out. We saw that with um, SARS, the original uh, severe respiratory syndrome, um, that uh, was able to be contained because it was severe enough and it was recognizable enough that we were able to quickly contain it back in the early part of this century. And we've seen that with other things too, such as uh, such as Ebola, but. COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 seems to be rather a good fit for success as a pathogen. It's a single-stranded RNA virus. You're gonna hear a lot more about this, I think, from my um, esteemed colleague, Dr. John Thomas, a little bit later today. It's um, similar to SARS-CoV-1. It's also similar to some of the viruses that cause the common cold. And probably most of us have been infected with a, cor a coronavirus at some time. That actually gets into the interesting question, by the way, of innate immunity and whether you know you as indiv an individual haven't been exposed to a, to a coronavirus that caused common cold symptoms in the past, whether you might have some degree of immunity to um, SARS-CoV-2 if your immune system just happens to fit that it's really ready to address SARS-CoV-2 if exposed. Anyhow, this virus is a strain that um, appears to have zoonotic origins, meaning that it, it seems to have uh, made a species leap from um, one animal to another. Um, and it may actually be from, from bats to humans. There's a lot of debate still on exactly how it made the trans species uh, leap, but um, it, it might have been from bats. And actually a lot of emerging diseases over the last few decades appear to have come from bats. There's one in, in neurology that um, I've studied, which is the Nipah virus, um, that's N-I-P-A-H, which emerged as an epidemic um, just a little prior to the year 2000. 
So um, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't show a lot of genetic diversity, meaning it really is likely, the spillover is likely to have occurred in late 2019, just as uh, you know, we were hearing about the early cases of the disease. Um, and it is a fairly good transmissible agent. It spreads between people through close contact, especially, um, especially via respiratory droplets pr produced from coughs or sneezes. Um, it gets in through your eyes, through your mouth, through your nose, but it's not really a respiratory disease. It does affect the respiratory system for sure, but you should also think of it as truly a virus that affects multiple systems of the body. Um, it causes inflammation of the endothelium, the lining of, of uh, the blood vessels, which is probably why we're seeing a lot of cases of stroke that are related to, uh, to COVID-19. It is not just a respiratory disease. It can go to a lot of different systems. And that's one of the things that causes so much of a problem. Another thing that causes a huge problem is that it seems to um, cause amplified immune responses in some people that can lead to, uh, to death. The big problem is that this disease transmits when asymptomatic. When I heard that back around the new year, um, I started to get a little worried. A new emerging disease that transmits before you show any symptoms is a recipe for a pandemic. It has a long incubation period as well, up to two weeks, although probably the, the most likely incubation period, most common that is, is probably about five days. Everybody knows now, unless, unless they are simply a denier of the disease, that it can really be quite serious with a fatality rate several times that of influenza. Um, serious cases occur in, in, in maybe five to 10% of people infected. We'll, we'll sort this out over time as, you know, with more precise numbers as we really examine the data from this pandemic. And serious cases are more likely to occur in, in older individuals or those with other, other diseases, um, including diabetes and obesity. We don't have a lot of treatments. We don't have a vaccine, although um, there are trials that are ongoing and I'm really hopeful to have one by the new year. You really can, you really, really can slow this disease down if you, um, um, are strict on isolation protocols. But these are only effective if they actually really are followed. And I think you can see that a lot of people don't follow isolation protocols and social distancing. And after loosening restrictions, we do see spikes in cases in areas. This slide shows um, what states have, um, have um, or are currently, that is, showing um, stable or decreasing numbers versus increasing. Increasing are in orange. And there are about 14 states that are statistically increasing um, right now. This is from the Johns Hopkins University site, by the way, which is a very, very good um, source of data for, for COVID-19. Um, the states that are showing increases probably ought to be doing more efforts around social distancing and uh, isolation, contact tracing, et cetera. And uh, perhaps those that are showing better trends are, are actually doing these things. In my own, um, my, my current home, the great state of Texas, we are showing a decreasing trend. And what I can say that is really happening is people um, the government overall seems to be taking um, isolation more seriously than they were several weeks ago. And additionally, the contact tracing army that was ramped up from the state health services and, you know, of which UTRGV um, has trained and employs 200 people doing contact tracing across the state of Texas probably is having some substantial positive effects. So as I mentioned, COVID-19 can be asymptomatic. You can go through the whole disease and basically not even really notice that you had it. Um, it also can be a mild, common cold-like illness. Um, an inability to smell 
as it affects the cells that, that convey um, olfactory sensation to the nervous system is really a strong indicator that you're dealing with COVID-19. We also see gastrointestinal distress. Severe cough, shortness of breath, and chest pain are, are really strongly worrisome symptoms. That mean you really should be getting um, a medical evaluation and possibly treatment. And then when it goes fully systemic, um, it becomes very, very dangerous and can lead to death. An interesting question um, relatively early on in the pandemic was whether we would see a socioeconomic status gradient of outcomes in the pandemic. And um, to illustrate what I'm really talking about here, I'm just showing you the casualties on the ocean liner, the Titanic. I borrowed this slide from my social epidemiology professor and another slide or two um, from, uh, from Dr. Ichiro Kawachi, who is really a pioneer in, in the discipline of social epidemiology. And um, what you can see on the Titanic is that people who were in first class, those customers who had paid the most and had the best cabins, were a lot more likely to survive than second or third class um, paying customers. Overall, the percent dead overall, they got to the lifeboats, and they survived. Socioeconomic gradient. People who could afford first class did better. Now the crew did about the same as third class, which, you know, I, I'm no expert on, on sailing. I served in the Air Force, not the Navy. But um, I understand the tradition, of course, for the crew to try to um, get everybody off the ship before, uh, before they go. And so it's not really surprising that that is really kind of the baseline of the worst possible outcome for casualties on a passenger liner. So really this socioeconomic gradient. Um, and the question was, will we see the same thing in COVID-19? And I think you know that we have. Um, we see more casualties among the um, socioeconomically disadvantaged, the people who are um, essential workers on the front line people who live in congregated housing, um, people who don't have as good of access to, to health care, and even independently of that, it looks like we're seeing more, um, more bad outcomes from COVID-19 in uh, folks from, from minorities. Um, the question is, is why? And I think common sense can tell you an awful lot of it. Um, one aspect is work environment. So, you know, if you're really in an area where you're working in close contact with others all the time, close personal contact, and that's your job, and you can't do another job, you're probably going to get, well, you're at higher risk of getting COVID-19, and then you're going to take it home. But the gradient may, might not be for just the obvious reasons of close contact. And I'll just tell you a little more, and, and this is really something more for you to think about rather than, rather than to, uh, to take as, as um, absolute fact. So this is from the Economic Policy Institute, and it just shows essential workers by industry, including gender, education level, race, and ethnicity. High level overview, essential workers. Um, individuals such as work in healthcare, um, food services, commercial, you know, the people who are at your um, Kroger or HEB or Albertsons, you know, whatever big supermarket you have in, in your part of the United States or, or area of the world. Um, women make up the majority of essential workers in healthcare, in government and community based services. Men, more common in the uh, energy sector and critical manufacturing. Um, people of color majority in food and agriculture, and in industrial, commercial, residential facilities and services. A lot of what really is absolutely staying open and is required um, for individuals to have exposure to others, including exposure to a lot of other people whom they don't know their name, they don't know their disease status, they just know they're around them. And in many places, people who go into these establishments are not required to mask, which the emerging science does really suggest helps to prevent the spread of the disease. 
That is, masking helps to prevent the spread of disease. But there may be more. There may be more to it. Remember I told you that um, people with um, other diseases tend to, tend to do worse with COVID-19? Well, what I'm going to ask you to think about here is whether individuals who are in essential jobs, or at least many of them, might have kind of a, um, a double whammy, as they say, of risk. Not just that they're exposed to other people, but that they also are at much higher risk of um, chronic diseases that predispose one for a bad outcome in COVID-19. This is the Karasek demand control model of jobs. Um, there are jobs with low strain, jobs that are active, jobs that are passive, and jobs that are high strain. That's high activity and high psychological demands where you really don't control what you're doing. I'll just give you an example, and this is from the original research. I realize looking at this that it's very genderized. This is old, but it's from the original research. And it also doesn't really reflect necessarily the kind of jobs that we would see today, such as a, a key puncher, um, you know. So low, low strain jobs have a high decision latitude. Think of your college professors, your university professors, um, not medical professors or, or healthcare worker professors, but they have a lot of decision latitude on what they do on a daily basis. And um, the psychological demands, as in, you know, their boss being on them to complete their work all the time is not there as much as it would be for someone who might be stitching garments in a factory. Has to be around a lot of other people, has to touch a lot of stuff, and they're really being pushed. They don't have a lot of latitude in how they're going to stitch the garments, and the people are on them to meet their quota. It gets stressful, it strains. Working in healthcare has a lot of psychological demands too, but you do have more decision latitude, which does help. What happens to these high strain individuals? They're at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease is one thing that happens, which also means that they have more hypertension, they have more diabetes, they have more obesity. I do a lot of work in community outreach, actually looking at, at our communities and looking at their vascular risk. I do this through screening with, uh, with my team. And I can tell you that when we've got out, gotten out into the communities up in Kentucky where we screened tens of thousands of people over a few years, and as we were getting started on this here in the Rio Grande Valley before COVID-19 hit, you better believe that a lot of the essential workers, middle-aged people have a lot of risks for cardiovascular disease and they aren't getting treatment. And again, who does the worst? People who have diabetes, who are obese, hypertension, older age, these risk factors accumulate and those with cardiovascular disease. Something I want to caution you about is really interpreting the clinical research that you might hear, because you hear something new all the time. Just remember that, um, you know, it kind of starts in human subjects research with a case report or case series, just an anecdote. It worked for this patient, maybe it'll work for everybody. Then you look at case control studies, especially like retrospective, and we don't have that much retrospective time really to look at COVID-19 yet. Um, cohort studies are, are great and things like um, looking at cardiovascular risk over time. But what we really, of course, need are randomized controlled trials that um, examine whether, whether particular treatments preventive measures are the best for uh, which ones work and are the best for COVID-19. This will let us ultimately do meta-analyses and develop clinical practice guidelines. A lot has been proposed around treatments. The evidence is really limited. I, I listed a few. There are a lot more. Just yesterday, I heard an anecdote about someone who went to a doctor and was given a treatment for lice and it cured their COVID-19. I don't know what to think about that. Um, I, th I think it probably, um, probably isn't really correct, but they believe it. Um, some of the things that are promising include certain antivirals, convalescent plasma therapy, and in the right patient at the right time, corticosteroids to lessen 
an out of control immune response that might kill them. Really important to think about immunity to SARS-CoV-2. Many people create antibodies to the disease when they're exposed and we can reliably measure the presence. We don't know what really means, what it, what it really means, if it means immunity. We don't know how long immunity lasts. We don't know what level of antibodies would be effective. And we also don't know if some people have pre-existing immunity, but I'll bet you they do. And then we have tools in public health that can be really effective. And these are the kind of tools that we've had for a long time. And this uh, pandemic has led me to do some additional reading about the um, influenza pandemic of 1918, of which there are interesting parallels. Did you know that some regions were more serious about uh, quarantine and isolation, were more serious about um, preventing group congregation than other areas, and these areas tended to do better with uh, outbreaks of influenza. Did you know that there were people who believed in wearing masks to prevent spread of the disease in 1918? And there were those who, who didn't, and there were serious arguments about it. And there was also a lot of unrest as um, World War I was raging in Europe, and a lot of people were, were absent Europe and part of Asia, and, um, and, and even part of Africa, um, and people were absent from the United States for World War I, and we, did, we really lacked um, our full healthcare force to deal with this pandemic at the time. So anyway, in reading about that, it's just enlightening, and I, I do encourage you as, as students and lifelong learners to learn from history, learn from the successes and mistakes of the past so that you don't have to make make those mistakes again. Um, but some of the public health tools that we have is to really think about the hierarchy of controls, which I'm going to show you a slide about. Testing and reporting. If you don't know who has a disease, you can't trace their, their contacts and you can't isolate their contacts and halt the spread of the disease. So um, testing, tracing, very, very important. So here's um, a hierarchy of controls. Most effective is to eliminate a problem, physically remove a hazard. Well, we can't really right now eliminate um, SARS-CoV-2. We don't, we don't have the capability of doing that yet. A vaccine will be somewhat effective, at least in that, um, if we're able to develop a good vaccine. Substitution or replacing the hazard, this hierarchy of controls, you can kind of ignore substitution because this hierarchy of controls was um, developed more around toxins in the environment, you know, like replacing a toxic material with another one. We're not probably going to engineer, re-engineer SARS-CoV-2 to be less toxic and replace the virus with it. Interesting idea theoretically, I'll bet it would have a lot of problems. So engineering controls, isolating people from the hazard, sure, you can stay away from the virus if you have the means to do so, if you happen to be in um, circumstances where you can, that is very effective. Administrative controls are also somewhat effective. That's changing the way people work, such as um, more spacing, having people wear, wear a simple mask at work, rotating people, having, having them at home sometimes and not at home at other times. And by work, I don't just mean your jobs. I mean where you interact with the community and with other human beings that might be at church, might be at school, it might be um, through, other, through other means. And the least effective is protecting with personal protective equipment. Personal protective equipment in the hands of um, a trained healthcare worker is pretty effective. I feel pretty comfortable being around people with COVID-19 if I have a good N95 mask on and, and goggles. Um, but it's not effective for, for everybody and you really need to know how to use this stuff properly. Um, in watching some young healthcare workers, some, some healthcare learners um, wearing an N95 mask um, via Zoom, 
I noticed multiple breaches, you know, just putting their hands under their mask to, to um, scratch their, their face, which would allow aerosols to get through. Now, you know, there's debate on whether aerosol um, transmission, you know, just that it hangs around in the air, SARS-CoV-2, whether that actually is a major source of transmission or not. Um, it, it probably is if a huge amount of aerosol is generated in an enclosed space and you're around it, my goodness, yes, of course. But what I mean is in the general public, whether aerosols are, are a means of transmission, and I, I have my doubts actually about that, but um, I will say that the N95 mask, which really is highly effective, but it has to be properly fitted. Um, I, I couldn't even with the amount of facial hair that I have right now properly uh, get a seal on most of these, but um, PPE is effective in the right hands, but it's not that effective in really preventing spread of disease in the general public, with probably the exception in, in uh, COVID-19 of just everybody wearing a mask and continuing to social distance and um, hand washing and good hygiene. Um, there's been some emerging research about safety and where you should or shouldn't go and what you should or shouldn't do. And this is probably some reasonable advice to give to patients. Um, just what's really essential. Um, and this is, a, this is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. It's from MIT. Cumulative importance index of doing something versus the danger due to proximity. So um, I, I like to go to a museum. Probably most of you all do too. It's probably relatively low if proper social distancing is used. But is it really that important and enough to risk the, take the relatively small risk of going? Um, going to the grocery store is really important to get your uh, food, but there is some danger. Actually going and sitting down at a restaurant, do you really have to do that right now? Higher danger. It can, it's important to eat, but you don't actually have to go do this in person. So. In blue are the things that are generally recommended to, to not do, darker blue. Um, you can take measures to decrease your risk in all these. And uh, in gold are the things that, you know, kind of generally you probably ought to do, the essential things. Maybe an easier way to, to think about social distancing is lowest risk to high risk. Stay at home by yourself or with other people that aren't getting exposed to others, probably the lowest risk. Good luck on that for, for those of us who work um, for, for a living. Um, the highest risk are things you can mostly avoid, and that is large in-person gatherings inside, especially if you're going to be talking loudly um, or, or singing or something like that. A few words about PPE. Um, in general, PPE should vary based on the type of transmission and level of risk. SARS-CoV-2 is easily transmitted and relatively high risk. So um, shield your eyes, shield your nose and mouth appropriately, gown, gloves. Um, this is just a table that was prepared based on available medical evidence for um, selection of personal protective equipment in, in healthcare workers at UT Health RGV. Contact tracing is really important, but in order to do contact tracing properly, you have to test widely. If you don't have positive tests and confine and identify those contacts, confine those if exposed and test them too, it's just not gonna work. If, if done properly, it allows you to cocoon cases of disease and um, really halt transmission. I I'm really proud of our contact tracing group of 200 um, at UTRGV. Last slide, just a little bit of philosophy and things to think about. We knew a pandemic was coming, predictable, expected. Um, we didn't know when, but we, we knew that eventually one was going to, going to uh, emerge. This COVID-19 pandemic will change our practice of medicine and of healthcare delivery in ways we don't yet fully appreciate. And while we learn a lot of new things about virology and disease transmission, immunity, et cetera, we're really learning the most about ourselves as a species. 
that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to um, take some questions. I'm not sure of the format for questions, but again, thank you for letting me be here. All right, thank you, Dr. Dobbs. That was a very amazing presentation. We do have time for a few questions. So if you have a question, please open up the Q&A uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen and send those in. We have a few that I can start reading you now, though. Um, OK. We had one question that was, could COVID have been prevented? Mm, I don't know um, is really the, uh, the simple answer. Um, maybe. and. My philosophical question is how many times have we pre prevented pandemics and we don't know? This one emerged. And as we learn more about it, we might learn how to prevent emergence of similar pandemics. Okay. Uh, you talked a little bit about PPE. Um, how Someone asked how effective are homemade and cloth face coverings and uh, what masks are actually the most effective? Well, the most effective mask, as far as we know, is a new, properly manufactured N95 um, particle mask or, you know, full um, PPE, basically sp spacesuit environment. But um, um, handmade cloth masks are, are, are great. It's recommended that you have at least two layers of material. Um, as much as you might like to wear material that would be a scarf that a family member may be knitted for you, um, something that's knitted with a lot of holes in it. And I, I don't mean holes actually in the scarf, but I mean just natural, relatively small holes in the material, no. Best off to use something that's um, made of a tight material with two layers. Look, here's one that we had made um, for UTRGV, you know, with even our logo on it. Um, it's kind of a, a cotton polyester material, layer one on the back, layer two on the front, very comfortable, probably, probably uh, pretty effective. All right. Do you think it will take the same amount of time to control COVID as it did for uh, influenza? Like with the 1918 pandemic and that it will come back for, for years? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that I don't know that it was really ever controlled as much as um, as much as I mean it was mitigated, but it wasn't wasn't eradicated the um, flu pandemic. Um, and viruses are strange things. The interaction with our species and viruses is also strange, and there are a lot of things that we don't know. So I don't know the answer, but you ask what I think. I think it's likely that um, it'll be with us for a while. Um, and instead of it being a pandemic, as we develop a vaccine that's effective, which I really, I believe that we'll be able to do, it's more likely that you'll see focal outbreaks in certain regions that you can kind of do um, deal with, with contact tracing and, and, uh, and treatment. All right. Uh, someone asked, will vaccines help? as we have had vaccines for other diseases like the swine flu, which is still a dreadful disease. That's right. You know, the only, the only virus that we have eradicated with vaccines is smallpox. Um, measles has a great vaccine, 1963, I think it came out, and yet we still get local outbreaks of measles every year, including at universities. Um, so they'll help, help a lot. The measles vaccine has saved many, many, many lives. Um, but based off of history, it's not likely to eradicate the disease. Okay. <clears throat> How long do you think it'll take for COVID to um, finally die down considering some of the strategies that the U.S. is using? And when we do have a vaccine, will we be able to open up like some of these other countries? Um, if the vaccine is available around the new year, then we'll be able to really accelerate getting back to life as we knew it before the pandemic. Um, meanwhile, as you decrease the number of cases through effective social isolation, contact tracing, um, this phenomenon that, that you uh, hear of called herd immunity is more people get the disease and and then have immunity so it's not as likely to, to go through um, a group of people. You'll see 
you'll see decreased disease and you'll see more comfort with getting, getting things back to normal. Um, we don't know, we really don't know if as the cases of the disease go down, like they're going down in Texas right now, if we really open it up after they're really down, how long it will take for it to expand back up. Um, I mean, we have pretty good ideas, but there's just a lot that we don't know that we don't know about this disease. Yes, definitely. Um, another question, would wearing contacts instead of glasses increase the probability of us getting the viruses or can glasses somewhat protect you? Oh, well, you know, as someone who is chronically nearsighted and, and is wearing glasses with kind of kind of big lenses today, I think you can tell what I think. Um, you know, if, if you wear contact lenses, which I've done for many years of my life, you're constantly touching your finger to your eye. It's reflexive. They're a little irritating, or at least that's been my experience. Um, the glasses, well, they're not the same as having a full face shield and certainly particles could get down in, you know, through the frame. But I'll tell you this, in healthcare over the years with wearing glasses, there have been many times when droplets of fluid have splattered on the glasses and not gone in my eyes. Okay. Is it true that sanitizing your shoes when you come back from being outside has an effect on lowering the chances of being infected with the virus uh, and like with others living in the same house? Um, I, I don't know. I don't think the evidence is really strong on that. And uh, personally, I, I don't do it. Okay. Um, is there any research that babies or toddlers are more prone to COVID-19? It's an excellent question. Um, it looks like younger people do better in gen general, that um, the question of um, newborns and the youngest with their developing immune system, I don't, th I don't think that's really fully settled, especially like in, in neonates. Um, there have been some, some deaths, but isolated. They're also uh, in a cocoon of protection, you know, naturally, so. Yeah, don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, uh, someone has a friend that has had COVID twice and they're asking, uh, I know you touched a little bit about secondary immunity, but um, mm -hmm. is there anything more that you could tell us about having, you know, a uh, prolonged... Uh, prolonged well, COVID or getting it twice? Yeah. Um, the number of people that are really, really thought by medical scientists to have been reinfected are low enough that if one is really highly likely to have happened that way, that it makes the headlines in the newspaper. So um, I saw the headline the day before yesterday, I think that someone in Nevada um, was, was you know, documented as being reinfected with COVID-19. Um, also, many of the, of the individuals who have, who have been you know, symptomatically reinfected um, turns out that probably it's just that they have prolonged disease, maybe from, from the immune system effects on COVID-19, kind of chronic disease in that way. I think as we figure this out with COVID-19, we're probably going to understand a lot more about disease transmission in general and reinfection with things like same, same strains of influenza, same strains of the common cold, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and we probably have time for just one more question, um, but if you have not gotten your question answered, we have a lot more speakers that might be willing to answer your question too, so feel free to resubmit those when those talk. And we'll have a but, panel at the end of the day too, right? Yes, and we'll have a final Q&A panel at the very end of the day, so if your question hasn't been answered by then, feel free to re-ask it. Um, but someone asked, what would you say the anti-vaccine movement will have, like what impact will they have on the 2021 prevalence of COVID-19? the anti-vaccine movement and the 2021 prevalence of COVID-19? <sighs> I know that's a big question. Yeah, that is, that is. Um, you know, I, I do believe that individuals should have the option of opting out from, from treatment. Vaccines are a little bit different because you're talking about, about preventing the spread of disease in, in a group of people, um, kind of in the same way of, you know, 
that's almost in the same way of anti-masking or anti-social distancing. Um, I, you can tell by my by my hesitancy. I don't have a great answer for this, but it'll have some effect. It'll probably be more of a it'll probably be more effect in the news really than than in reality. Um, mo most people are are willing and interested in getting getting vaccinations for diseases. Um, it's kind of a minority of people that just really, really don't understand it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dobbs, for joining us today and for everything that you shared with us. Of course. Happy to be here. I'll, I'll stick around off and on throughout the day, too. So thank you. Looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.